We're looking at the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall do your work. The seventh is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. We've been looking through the Old Testament at the various principles, the various passages. We've looked into the New Testament to see the teaching of Christ. We've seen that God instituted this day at the very beginning with his royal son, Adam, created it for him, modeled for him how he was to work six days and rest one. We've seen how God, when he called together his people in the midst of giving them biblical principles as to how to live in covenant relationship with him and to enjoy covenant fellowship with him in the midst of those commandments that he spoke directly to them, he graciously included the commandment to set apart, to sanctify a day, to remember that day, observe that day. And he preserved it for them. And he directed them how to preserve it and to keep it holy. We've seen how the people of God, and kind of in passing, rejected that and did not keep the Sabbaths and did not keep that covenant. And, and God spoke to them judgment. But in the midst of the prophets' voices, there was one voice that we looked at in Isaiah chapter 58, verses 13 and 14. I'll just have you turn there that these words might continue to ring in our hearts. Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14, where we saw God again telling them of the promised blessings that he has attached to this day. in the setting in which formal religion marked many of the people of God, in a day in which many had turned their back from God and had gone astray, God, through his prophet, spoke these words, If, because of the Sabbath, you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, a holy day of Jehovah, honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure, and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in Jehovah, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of Jehovah has spoken. And we sought to take up something of what Jesus and his relationship to the Sabbath was like and how he faithfully observed the Sabbath, how he fervently taught about the Sabbath in order to cleanse it of all that was encrusting it by these Pharisees of his day, but yet how he forever changed the Sabbath. And he, rising on the first day of the week, and he, from his, at the place, at the right hand of God, sent his spirit to his people on the first day of the week. Forever marked that day as the day that his people, from that time forward, were to commemorate creation and the new creative work of their redeeming Savior. And to mark redemption, not redemption from Egypt, but redemption from sin, when Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power, and Christ was declared to be all that he said he would when he raised, was raised from the dead to sit at God's right hand. And that's what we commemorate. That's what we commemorate when we gather together on the first day of the week. Commemorate all that Christ has done for us as our Creator and our Redeemer. And we should expect and anticipate then something of these blessings which Isaiah the prophet spoke in his day. We should anticipate these things being fulfilled among us as we seek to follow after and to honor our God, our Jehovah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that he's different than the one in the Old Testament, but he has been clearly shown to be Jehovah. And we should expect these kinds of blessings 
to be ours. We have seen the blessing of the day, and there's a sermon by Robert Murray McShane, I love the Lord's day, in which he declares all these benefits that are his, that are the Christian's and ought, the Christian ought to expect on that day. And he says, therefore, I love the Lord's day. And then there's another sermon by B.B. Warfield in which he explicitly says, I'm not here to talk about the benefit we receive, but our duty to keep the Lord's day. And both of these men set forth those truths as privileges. Brethren, it's our privilege to anticipate blessing from God on his holy day when we delight in him and delight in his day. And it's our privilege to obey the King of kings and Lord of lords who has given us a directive to set aside a day to draw near to him. What privilege is ours? Now, I've spent eight sermons opening up the script scriptural teaching on the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath, in which I have sought to show that every human, and especially, especially every Christian, has the gracious, joyous privilege and obligation before God to fulfill the fourth commandment, to remember and observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Today, then, it is my desire to spend the entire sermon in application, giving directives and counsel regarding how we might fulfill this duty. Now, I'll have to admit, I'm a little uncomfortable because I don't generally preach this way. But as I have surveyed all the material, this is like the last chapter of almost every book that I've read, or or a big chunk of chapters in the middle of the books that I've read. Here are the exhortations. Here are the counsels given. Here's the directives. How then do we keep the Lord's day? There's a helpful summary that I'm following, and it's kind of a general outline found in our confession of faith. It reads this way. The Sabbath is then kept holy unto the Lord when men after a due preparing of their hearts and ordering their common affairs beforehand, do not only observe a holy rest all day from their own works, words, and thoughts about their worldly employments and recreations, but are also taken up the whole time in the public and private exercises of his worship and in the duties of necessity and mercy. And that statement is going to be something of the structure that I am going to use. That's found in the London Baptist Confession of 1689, chapter 22, paragraph 8, for those of you who would like to look it up later. Let's begin, then, this extended application. The first thing that I want to say in terms of application, and if and if you're here visiting today and you haven't heard those other eight messages, I just all I can say is read some of these good books that I've been talking about and get better input or go back and listen to those messages and get some of that background to, to support what I'm going to say this morning. First is this. We are to engage in a weekly, day-long, holy rest. A weekly day-long, holy rest. Now, I've chosen the word engage because I like the word because it has so many different nuances to it. You can engage uh, gears on your car by pushing the clutch and, and putting it into gear, and you engage, and things come together, and you move forward. You can engage the enemy when you go out to battle and you come face to face and, and begin to be, come into battle with them. You engage the enemy. It's an active word. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that's got energy behind it. And I want to convey that this morning. If you get anything out of what I'm going to say this morning, the Lord's Day is work. Blessed work. And I want 
to say the first that we must engage in a weekly, day-long, holy rest. Now note, first of all, to what the writers of our confession and what I'm seeking to capture in this, it is a weekly, day-long rest. Now I made this point, so I'll make it very briefly. I made it earlier, but it needs to be emphasized. Not just an hour, not just a morning, not just an evening. It's the Lord's day. Remember the Sabbath day. Now, however you break up the 24 hours, that's a 24-hour slot of time in our society. Now, some say it's from sunset Saturday to sunset Sunday. Because that's the way we see it in Genesis, and that's the way some of the Jews se seem to, to gauge their time. Well, the fact of the matter is, if you look at the scripture, there's absolutely no biblical exhortation or universal description that indicates that's always how time was kept. And it's much more culturally conditioned for us to think of 24-hour day from midnight to midnight. And generally what I have found from people who talk about wanting to go from sunset to sunset is that they want to cut off early so they can enjoy the last half of the football game on Sunday afternoon. So they can go off and, and play somewhere while it's still their time off from their regular work. That's generally where I've heard it. Now, that's not true of everyone. I'm not making a universal declaration. Everybody who's that way is an apostate. They really don't want to keep... No, that's not the point. But the point of the matter is, when we think of a day, we think midnight to midnight. We think of a 24-hour slot. And in fact, we probably think of when I go to bed on Saturday night to when I go to bed on Sunday night, that's my day. You know, here at Trinity, we have long mornings on Sundays, don't we? Because... I'll say to almost everyone who goes by, nice to see you this morning. Good morning. And it's almost always afternoon. So you know, the fact of the matter is, it's, it's not so much that we keep a clock and gauge this thing. It's not so much that we find some specific boundaries. It's not so much that we set some strict limits so that on Saturday night at 12 midnight, all the games have to be put away and everything has to be done and we... And so then, 12.01, we can plan to leave on vacation, and then we can be gone on, you know. It's not so much that, that we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to give him a whole day. That means we're to, to think in terms of a big block of time, which is at least something like 24 hours, falls at the first of every week on the day called Sunday, and that's his time. And if we're going to stretch it anyway, let's stretch it out, not squeeze it in. And so the writers of the confession have rightly captured this reality that it is a day, and this is an important matter, to give all the time to God that is his required time. And notice, it's every week. It's not Easter and Christmas. It's not, well, you know, one Sunday out of four. Every week. One day out of every seven. The first day it's not negotiable. Well, I'll take Sunday this week, and I'll take Tuesday next week, and maybe Friday the following week. No, it's always a weekly Sabbath, the beginning of the week. Engage in a weekly, day-long, holy rest. But then notice how they describe the rest. So that's the time of the rest. Now a description of the rest. It is a ceasing from the works, words, and thoughts about their worldly employment and recreation. Ceasing from the works, words, and thoughts about their worldly employment and recreations. Notice first, it requires work. The commandment requires work. If you're going to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, then you're supposed to work six days. That's what is the context for keeping one day. God did not make a day for man to play. God did not make a day for man that they could live for that day and be idle all the rest of the time. God made man to work. Children, God did not make you to play. God did not make you to just have fun. It's good to have fun, but we ought to have fun working. 
I'm preaching to myself here. I love it when I'm digging around in my Bible. That's fun for me. That's my work. But the fact of the matter is, we weren't made to play, we're made to work. And so this very commandment, if we're going to enjoy the one day, we have to work six. And maybe some of us don't really enjoy the one day that God's given to us because we're being lazy on the other six, or two out of the other six, or three out of the other six, or even one out of the other six. The rest of the Lord's day is inconsistent with a lazy life. Fulfill your calling. And you should see how many of the books actually go down that path and spend pages and pages talking about you must fulfill this calling if you're to enjoy this privilege. It requires work. But the rest of the Lord's Day is actually in itself work. We'll come to that in just a minute. But we're not allowed then, excuse me, I, I get back to my notes here. It requires us to work six days, labor for those days, and have one day of rest. Now, I wish I could take all the negatives out of this commandment. That's something of what my heart is, but that's not the way God gave it to us. God didn't just give us the positives. Now, I've tried to emphasize the positives, that we might see the blessing that is ours in having one day out of seven. But God didn't give it to us that way. He gave it to us as a day of rest in which we do no work, in which we turn our feet from our own ways and avoid our own words and since the words and our actions grow out of what we do in our hearts, then it means that we must also govern our hearts on his day, that we might speak words and do things which are in keeping with it and keep ourselves from that work and enjoy the rest he's promised to us. Listen to B.B. Warfield. This is the day on which the tired body rests from its appointed labor on which the worn spirit finds opportunity for recuperation, an oasis in the desert of earthly cares, when we can escape for a moment from the treadmill toil of daily life and refresh our souls in God. Now, does that sound like a, a burden? You can't do your work today. But, but I've got this project I've got to get done to please my boss and to get this thing done. I've got to get that done. That's a good thing, right, to work. Well, I've got this particular sport or this particular thing I like to do, and you're saying I can't do that? You say I've got to give up all my work? Ah, oh, that sounds like legalism. Well, I don't know. Does this sound like legalism? To have a place where your worn spirit can recuperate? To find an oasis in the middle of the desert? to get off of the constant treadmill, to get out of the hamster wheel? Is that something that you call a burden? God says, that's a blessing. I've given you this day to rest. Get out of the hamster wheel. Stop running in that track that you've been running in all week. Turn your mind from that. Turn your actions from that. Turn your words from that. Take your heart out of that for a day. I give you the privilege of doing so and having a good conscience doing it. Don't do it on Monday when your boss is telling you what to do, when your teachers are giving you assignments. God's given you Sunday, the first day of the week, to do that. Listen to Phil Riken as he talks about the same point. And I just thought about just giving nothing but quotes today because, because that's really what I'm doing. It's all these applications come from various writers and they're just smothered in my words. But here's Phil Riken. He said it so well. Close the calendar. Go off the clock. Put away the to-do list. It is a day to step out of the frenzy. Stop buying and selling, and quit worrying about the profit margin. In a culture that increasingly treats Sunday like any other day of the week, thereby turning what, what is sacred into something secular, we need to resist the tendency to let our work enslave us. Keeping the Lord's Day holy is a biblical answer to workaholism. Stop and rest. That takes faith. 
but, but that's one day I can't then be making profit. Yeah. You going to trust me? Six days you collect your manna. The sixth day you collect double because Sunday, or excuse me, that day was Sabbath. The Saturday, you won't collect any. You going to trust me that I'll provide for you? God always brings us to the point where we have to believe him. He keeps us in the posture of belief and faith. We saw in Isaiah 58, and in our own confession highlights it, that the Lord's day is not to be fun day. It's to be the Lord's day. So I can't get away from the negatives. We have to turn our backs and turn, turn our feet from going in our own ways. The weekly work, the weekly recreations, the weekly ordinary pleasures of life are to be set aside in order to have this holy rest. But now, before you get into all the questions, we'll come to some of those questions, Lord willing, in a few moments. Let's look at the character of the rest. I specifically chose a word that our confession and the catechisms engage in a weekly, day-long, holy rest. Holy. Something set apart unto God. Something done for the purpose of honoring him. It is done for the purpose of drawing near to him. This rest is in that category. It has that character to it. It is a rest that is done in the sight of God. It's a rest that is done in honor to God. It is a rest that is done to enjoy our God. It is a day when we can allow our souls. Brethren, don't you feel the pressure all week long? I want my soul to run out to God. And then the clock ticks. And the bus comes. And the desk is calling. And the dishes have to be done. And you want your soul to have freedom to run. And it just can't because there's not the time to do it. But that clock doesn't tick on Sunday. That work clock ought not to press itself on the Lord's day. It's the day when we can come and let our souls run out to God. We can let them run in the pastures where they will be well fed. We can, in a sense, and to some degree, release the grips on the reins of our hearts. Don't we have to do that sometimes? We have to rein in the heart. Oh, I want to speak of Christ. But I'm in the workplace, and I've got an employer, and I, I can't just stand here and talk about this all day. And so you rein it in. Oh, I've got to give my mind to this project. I've got this, this, this task to help my child with, or I've got this paper that I've got to write, and I've got to bend my mental efforts to this, and so I have to rein in my heart, which wants to run down that path of what I read in my devotions this morning. And I've got to rein it in. Why? I have a calling. Six days you shall labor. And so I've got to do that to the glory of God. But on the Lord's day, I can loosen my grip on the reins and let my heart run where it wants to run when it wants to run toward God. I can, in a sense, and to some measure, put blinders on to the normal cares of life. Those cares which so frequently choke out or strive to choke out the word. And I can say, no, and put blinders on today. This is the Lord's day, and I can fix my attention upon him and let my soul have liberty to run toward the life-giving, soul-refreshing, burden-lifting God. That's why we have this day. It is a holy rest, a rest unto the Lord. Listen to Thomas Watson. When the falling dust of the world has clogged the wheels of our affections. Don't you love that imagery? Clogging dust of the world. It clogs the wheels of our affections. It's getting in there and mucking everything up. And they can scarce move towards God. Then the Sabbath comes and oils the wheels of our affections, and they move swiftly on. The heart, which all the week was frozen on the Sabbath, melts with the word. 
and the Sabbath is a friend to religion that is in true Christianity and the soul. It files off the rust of our graces. It is a spiritual anniversary, a spiritual jubilee when freedom is declared wherein the soul can have conversation with its maker. A holy rest, a weekly, day-long, holy rest. We are to engage in that. We are to give ourselves to that. Now notice that the rest then of the Lord's Day is not a rest of inactivity. Listen to the shorter catechism here. This is a very, a very poignant statement. There's a little phrase in the middle that, that jumped out at me. It's in the larger catechism. It's in the shorter catechism. It says this, what is forbidden in the fourth commandment? Now, those of you who've memorized the catechism, you can be thinking along with me, right? What is forbidden in the fourth commandment? The fourth commandment forbids the omission or careless performance of the duties required. And the profaning the day by idleness. Or doing that which is in itself sinful or by unnecessary thoughts, words, or works. Except so much as to be taken up in the works of necessity and mercy. Did you hear that little phrase right there in the middle? Profaning the day by idleness. And many of the writers speak of not keeping the rest like the donkey. The donkey just sits down and sleeps. And inactivity was not in God's mind, and therefore we are to engage when we come to this day. Joey Piper put it this way, God, however, does not want you to divine, define the day by what you may not do, but, by, but rather by what you may do. Warfield said this. I told you it's going to be a lot of quotes. I hope they're understandable. I picked them out very precisely. Inactivity was not the mark of God's Sabbath. When he rested from the works which he creatively made, up to this very moment, he has been working continuously and imitating him. Our Sabbath is also to be filled with work. And we, like him, are to do our appointed work. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, and then, laying it all aside, turn to another task. In one word, the Sabbath is the Lord's day, not ours. And on it is to be done the Lord's work, not ours. And that is our rest. We are to rest from our own things that we may give ourselves to the things of God. And that's why the Puritans called it the market day of the soul. Have you ever been to one of these countries where they still have bazaars? And you see the markets, or like we were coming back from Haiti, and you see market day. And the people have pulled these huge carts that they have loaded six to eight feet high. And they've loaded them with all kinds of things, plantains or rice. Or, and they're pulling these things, and they're there before we are. We leave at six, and they're already setting up their booths, and the gates don't open till after eight. And they're there because it's market day and it's their one day to get into the Dominican Republic with all of their goods and they haul them or they pull them or they pile them on their heads and they do everything they can to get there and labor for that market day. There's only two days out of the week that they can do that. And they work on that market day and then they hawk they call to people, and they try to get them to come over and enjoy their wares. They're there because that's their market day, and that's their one day to make a profit. And they work. Oh, how they work. The Puritan said the Sabbath, the Christian Sabbath, was the market day of the soul. What do you think they meant by that? They meant that you go to the market and do transactions with God. 
and with the people of God. You're interacting and you're doing these, these transactions with God for the good of your soul with no less energy than you do in the public market all week long. We should labor to engage profitably on the market day of the soul. And so here's my second point. Engage weekly in a day full of focused spiritual transactions with God. L engage weekly in a day full of focused spiritual transactions with God. I use those words full and focused. Because the Sabbath is over and over described as a day unto the Lord. We saw last week that in the New Testament, the focus of the day is clarified by the person and work of Jesus, who is the Lord of the, the Sabbath, who is, supremely over, who is supremely over the Lord's day. And so our focus is to be significantly and fully upon our Redeemer and our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is to be the full and focused attention of our minds. As one writer said, there is no keeping of the Sabbath apart from Christ. You can be as diligent and at keeping all of the rules and doing all of the good things that you think you ought to do and turning away from your normal activities and keeping away from anything that anybody might say was a problem on the Lord's Day Sabbath and you may still miss the Sabbath rest. Because apart from Christ and trusting in Christ and following after Christ and apart from Christ doing a work in your heart and Christ's grace being the motive behind you and the love of Christ and the honor of Christ being the focus, you have missed keeping the Sabbath and you miss the Sabbath rest. Oh, you may get some small side benefit from it because God has ordered his world that we need one day in seven for rest, but there's far more than that. Far more than that. It is to be full and focused effort. And so I would say there ought to be something of a cry that goes up in our minds when we get up and put our feet on the floor on the Lord's Day. Let's go to market today. Let's go to market today. I have needs. I have things that I want to give unto my God in honor of my God. I want to go in the marketplace and do good for my soul and to help my brethren that they too might benefit on this day. When something is called holy in the Bible, it's almost always or, or at least predominantly set apart for the worship of God. That means it is set apart from the normal, common use that it might otherwise have, and it is set apart that it might be used to draw near and to worship God. Therefore, one of the primary ways that we remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy is to engage in worship. And as we have seen from the Bible, the Sabbath days are days set apart for holy convocations. When the people of God came together to offer their sacrifices to God. When they came together in Nehemiah's day and Ezra's day to hear the word of God read to them. There was a corporate gathering together to hear God's word and to offer sacrifices to God. This is what was done on the Sabbaths. And therefore, almost every book that I read that deals with the Christian Sabbath points out that the primary purpose of the Lord's Day, the primary purpose, is the worship of God. That's how we engage primarily on the Lord's Day. That's what this day is set aside for, primarily for the holy worship of God. As the confession says, taken up the whole time in the public Exer pu pu public and private exercises of his worship. And so we're here to do business with God. We're here to work. And what a glorious work. 
We're here to take up all that we can of the Word of God and the grace of God to take it to heart and apply it to ourselves so when we hit the ground Monday morning and we're slogging it out in the dust of the world again and amidst all of the enemies of our soul and we go back out there to throw ourselves in for the glory of God to labor, we have stocked up in the special presence of our God and we have taken that opportunity to give vent to that bursting bubble, in our, that bursting uh, wineskin, as it were, in our hearts, that we wanted to give vent to that love to God and worship that God. We came in and we gave ourselves to seek to meet with God. We had to labor to do that. We have to work hard at doing that. And Watson has a whole section just on how to worship God aright that we might actually engage him and keep the Lord's day. But that's the work that we're engaged in, seeking to meet with God, taking the opportunity afforded to expressly, explicitly honor our God. And therefore, you must be with the church when they gather. That's fundamental to keeping the Lord's day and keeping it holy, is being there where God meets with his people that you might be able to give to him those sacrifices and receive from him those blessings. And then you must give yourself wholeheartedly to offer those sacrifices to God. You must give yourself eagerly to the hearing and receiving of the word of God by his servants. It is Paul who declares that we learn about the boundless love of Christ with all the saints. Here is where we learn it. It's one of the predominant places we learn the love of Christ is interacting with one another, sitting under the word of God and then seeking to live it out with one another and ministering to one another. So we must strive to improve all the means of grace associated with the public gatherings of God's people. We've got to work. This is the transaction. This is the work we're engaged in. This is our privilege to go to market and to meet with God. But what about our children? What about children? Can you, can you be engaged in that? Can you be a part of that? There's no, there's no age limit to meeting with God. There's no age limit to knowing God blessing you with these rich blessings. The blessings come to those who seek him in Christ Jesus. The blessing comes to those who are trusting in Christ and seeking to engage God on his day, no matter how young you might be. But it's really the parents who are asking that question, aren't they? What about my children? And that's a good question. I'm glad you're asking that question. If you're not, I just put it in your mind. I hope you're now thinking about it. You see, the Lord's day is your day in a peculiar way, your day to teach and explain the duties and privileges of the Lord's day to them. The duties and privileges of, work, of meeting with God. The duties and joys of interacting with God. You can teach and explain those duties in a special way. We looked in the adult class at this passage. Turn now with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. As we seek to go to market, what about our children? Do we leave them in the nursery school? Children are sitting here. Nursery for us ends at the age of, uh, I think it's three. We can no longer put them in nursery, and they're encouraged to sit here and worship with us. What about your children in keeping the Lord's Day? Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 8 says this. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which Jehovah your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your sons and your grandsons might fear Jehovah your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged, O Israel. 
You should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly, just as Jehovah, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah is our God. Jehovah is one. And you shall love Jehovah your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. Not so much that you will see it, but so that they will see it. It will be evidently part of your life. Brethren, our children are being bombarded with voices. Hosts of voices that are seeking to get their ears, that they might get their minds, that they might draw away their hearts. They come from teachers, professors. They come through billboards. They come through television screens. They come through little devices that we hold in our hands. They come from the internet. They are getting their voice to our children's ears or to their eye. And they are desperately trying to do that day after day after day. And don't you find it difficult? I didn't ask enough questions. I didn't find out who they were with. And I didn't find out what they heard. Now, I've had the privilege of having my children at home, being homeschooled and involved in, in our lives for, I don't know how many years. I'm not even going to try to guess. I think it's 20-some years. And yet, one of mine went off to college a few years ago. And now there are voices coming into her ears that I can't stop because she's in the classroom. And I'm asking questions all the time. And then a day will go by or two days will go by. Or we, oh, man, I haven't asked her. What if, what if some little seed has gotten in to that ear and has gotten into that tender heart? What if something has snuck in through the back door of some friend of your child? Some video game that they play? Some television show that they watched? Some commercial that they saw? Some billboard that screamed at them? What if something has snuck in and you say, oh, my, would that I had some concentrated time with my son or my daughter just to sit down and start working with them and pull these things out and find out and put some good in. Family worship is just so squeezed every night. We get a few minutes and then they're off doing their homework or they're off on their job or they're... Would that I had some concentrated time that I might pour into them the word of God. Oh, yes, I do it when I walk in the way, and I strive to do it at every moment when I'm speaking with them, but I need some big blocks. Guess what? You've got a big block. It's called the Lord's Day. And you can start from the moment that they get up, and you can go throughout the day, and you can do it before they go to bed. Teach them what it is to rest turning away from the things that are the normal activities of life, turning away from all those voices that are getting their attention. Teach them to turn and look into the face of God in Christ. Teach them what it means to be holy like God is holy. Teach them what it means to come into the presence of the living God. Teach them. Take the Lord's day and teach them. Now, it's not only the Lord's day. But certainly here is a block of time in which we can use for that purpose. Teach them what it means to worship the living God. Teach them about the privileges that God promises to give to those who gather in his presence. Teach them. Here's a block of time. God's given it to you. Are we using it? But not only must we teach and explain the duties and privileges, we need to train and exemplify what rest really means by our own lives. For our words will mean very little if our lives do not match up with our words. And so there you are, 
hassled and, rest, and restless because you went to bed too late on Saturday night and, and you come into the Lord's house, oh man, can you believe that person's over there again? I've got to talk to the... And your kids are seeing that and say, oh, mom, dad really like going to the house of God. All they do is complain about the people of God and they complain about the sermons and they complain about this and they complain about that. And, you know, they just seem to be burdened all the time. All they can think of is, I want to get back to my project. I want to get back to my workplace. I want to get out of this house. These kids are driving me nuts. And that's what the Lord's Day is to them. Or they see dad and mom doing the same thing on, on the Lord's Day that they do all week long. There's no real difference. They wouldn't know what day it was except they looked at their calendar when they got up. Train them by example. Do you delight in the Lord's Day? Do you delight in Jehovah? Let it boil out of you. Let it pour out of you all over your children. That they might say, wow, you know, I don't know why dad and mom get so excited about those old hymns. But boy, there are tears coming down their eyes sometimes. And they just seem to want to keep talking about it all afternoon. They keep coming off to that sermon. It's, it's, it's amazing. So your children get a sense, man, mom and dad really love the Lord's day. Manifest a proper disposition for your children. Celebrating the Sabbath written by Bruce Ray has two chapters about how to keep the Lord's day and his titles are these. We should keep them holily and happily and we should keep them honestly and humbly. That's what you ought to manifest to your children. You know what? Children, Sitting around this table, God met with me this morning and God convicted me of sin and I want to be honest. I was honest when I went into the house of God and he dealt with me as I prayed. And now I'm here with, before you and I need to tell you, Daddy has sinned. Will you forgive me? Mommy's not been the woman that she should have been toward Daddy. Mommy's not been the woman she should have been toward you. Mommy's not been the Christian woman that she should have been in your presence. Will you forgive me? God has found me out on his day. Train and exemplify what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength in the very worship of God. Train them and exemplify what it means to rest, to have that holy rest, and to think of this day as so very important. And fathers and husbands, this falls primarily on you. The commandment is given that your servants, your sons, your daughters, everybody in your house is to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And you're not just there to bark out odors. Don't do this. Do that. Don't do this. Do that. You're there to exemplify for them. You know what? We want to give our hearts to God today. So, so son... I think we better put the bike away today. And we might think more about this. I think we ought to put that away for now. Let's not talk about that for now. That was good. We'll, we'll come back to that paper on Monday. Let's just put that aside right now. and Let's fix our hearts upon God. Christ labors to see his bride free from every spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Are you laboring to that end on the Lord's day? Husbands, not just the Lord's Day, but especially on the Lord's Day. God gave you children to train up in the discipline and admonition of the Lord. Is this part of that training that you're giving them? This has to do with you leading and engaging and helping and loving. And joyfully displaying this is what it's all about. Train up your children. Well, I'm going to have to stop there. I've got way too much to try to get through my next point. There are so many practical applications. As I told several people, I said, you know what? I just want to, almost just want to quote the books. You say, let me just give you this guy's point here, this, uh, this one's here, this one's here. But the fact of the matter is, brethren, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do that we might engage 
in a holy rest on a weekly basis, on a whole day. We've got a lot of work to do that we might engage in a full and focused spiritual transactions with God. We need to labor to bring Christ forefront in our mind's eye on this day. We need to be part of that effort that Christ would be lifted up, that all men would be drawn unto him. It's not just the preacher's job. But that one who was lifted up upon the cross, it's our labor to point him to him. Our labor to bring him close to us. To direct our children to look unto him. To teach, to explain, to train, to exemplify. May God help us to engage on the Lord's day. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it just seems as though we're just scratching the surface. When we see the privilege that you've given to us, when we've seen the responsibility that is ours to enjoy this day, and we know the enemies that are within and the enemies that are without to draw us away from that, Lord, we plead with you. Help us. Help us to value this day enough that we would be willing to labor on your day, for your glory, to rest as we ought, to put away and cease from what we ought, and to take up what we ought in this day. Help us, O oh God, as we seek your face for forgiveness, for how much we have fallen short, and for grace to better use your holy day for your glory and for our good. Please hear and answer our prayers offered to you in Jesus' name. Amen.